Hello and welcome to another episode of the Tri Mechanics podcast. This podcast is all about interval training, particularly with a focus on cycling interval training, although a lot of the principles could be carried across to both running and swimming. So the reason I'm going to do a podcast about interval training today is because, uh, again, this is a topic that comes up again and again about a comparison between different training models, methods, particularly this time of year, we're starting to think about racing. We've started to, a lot of people have gone through that kind of period of the winter where they've been doing um, well, relatively maybe longer easy training or maybe kind of haphazard here and there. And they're thinking now, right, well, I need to get the most out of what I'm doing, but also I want to try and get the most out of my body and physiology ready leading towards that kind of race season side of things. So the reason that that's um, essentially it's become a hot topic is because no one interval training regime seems to work for everybody. Plus also, if you go for the kind of interval side of things, are you going for longer, kind of essentially easier intervals, the kind of more sweet spot threshold model, or are you going towards the kind of higher intensity polarized model? So there's been a lot of evidence thrown from different areas now. And on the best summaries I think I've heard of this uh, by Stephen Seeler who's done a lot of the research on the polarized training model was on a recent podcast Um, I think it was the game um, podcast and I'll link I'll set up a link in the show notes to it it was very interesting listening because he talked about why there was this model developed why it became it was essentially from practical um, and seeing how athletes actually did things and that that then informed the the idea of doing the research so originally this podcast possibly was going to be called new ideas but new is a very bad word to use in this situation because actually these are all old ideas they're ideas that have been used for a long period of time and they've just essentially come back into fashion now because research has been done on those old ideas and proven what works and what doesn't work this also mixes in with some of the stuff from the book endure which is written by alex hutchinson i'm hopefully going to be speaking to soon um, about the whole, essentially the role of the brain more than anything else in endurance sport. And that miss, that, that kind of everything that goes, that mix with the kind of brain, the psychology, um, the work by Sam McCora, the work on essentially fatigue, um, inducing mental fatigue and then essentially seeing the decline in performance, but also possibly using that as a method of training. But the critical thing is that if you put all these ideas together, you start to see a certain pattern. So Stephen Steele was talking about the fact that when it comes, what he saw was he saw the fact that the elite athletes, when they went easy on their easy days, they went very, very easy. Now, this comes back to this whole idea I was talking about as running being a, a skill and that those sessions where the, the, the uh, I talked about the program on BBC where the Irish priest was leading that session um, around the playing field and the, the elite marathon runners were running at almost no speed at all, concentrating on the skill of movement. Now, the same sort of goes with cycling in that actually it's a repetitive movement. So therefore, the more times you do it, the more essentially very, very, um, very small amounts of increments of skill increase in our ability to contract the muscles, firing patterns and all these things. So doing that kind of long, easy stuff has that effect. But also, this is what that Stephen Sear took from these athletes is they were doing these very, very kind of easy sessions, really focusing on the skill, focusing on what they were actually doing, what the sport actually was, the movements, and relaxing and essentially using that to increase their overall efficiency. But at the same time, they're combining that with very high intensity training. Now, the key thing he noted, and it's talked about in this podcast and what we're going to be talking about, is it wasn't that high intensity. It was high enough intensity to induce pain really induce hurt induce pain induce that feeling that you can't do this for very long and then they held it for a long time and that's the critical difference that is the difference that separates a lot of elite athletes and the training of the elite athletes from non-elite athletes is their ability to suffer at a high intensity and in, and prolong that suffering for longer than you would expect to be able to do so this is what they did in the studies. So rather they were comparing things like two minute intervals, four minute intervals, and then eight minute intervals. Now the eight, you hypothesize maybe the eight minute intervals weren't that high intensity because it was eight minutes, but they were going at nearly VO2 max for eight minutes. And then with a very short break, they were doing the same thing again. And this is the bit, this is, goes back to that endure and that side of things is that a lot of our limits are predisposed by the brain 
And we play with those. It's like a game. We are playing with the us and the brain and our physiology and all those other factors. That's why things like coffee and caffeine work. Low doses of caffeine can keep you kind of switched on, can help you keep switched on in terms of mental like mental tasks. And that's what a lot of the research that people like Sam Makora have done. But the other thing is that high dose of caffeine can induce euphoric state where you feel like you're on top of the world and you can do anything. And that plays into that endurance side of things is that you your, your endurance increases briefly because you feel like you could keep going forever. So how does this then apply to interval training? Well, I just mentioned it, things like the eight minute intervals. The idea of doing eight minute intervals at almost VO2 max would make most, the idea of it would make most people sick. But it works and it works in research. The key thing is how do you get there and how do you then reverse almost your idea of interval training? So rather than going out and doing your standard interval training, let's say you decide to do four, you know, four minute intervals with a four minute break, in my mind, is, is nowhere land. Three minute intervals with a three minute break, again, nowhere land. The reason those intervals are relatively uh, common is because they're relatively easy. Now, going three minutes at all out is not that hard and not that easy, but also not that hard either. It feels hard, but actually having them three minutes break, as opposed to the elite athletes that may only have a minute break, the thing is they have an idea of that they don't really care whether that they max out the amount of power they can put out in that interval. All they're trying to do is achieve overload. So they might do 10 of those intervals, whereas most um, age group athletes will get to six or seven and say, well, I'm not going to do any more. If you are really into this stuff, there's a concept in the Train Race and the Power Meter book talking about interval and decay, is that you can only you should only stop doing an interval session when you can no longer hold about 5% below the average of the second or third interval. And so actually, if you use that as a rule, you often find you do one or two more intervals than you were planning and don't set out a, a predetermined number. And that's what it all comes down to, is that essentially what you want to do is you want to hurt for a while that feels longer than you want and you want to give up but you keep going for just a bit longer or you add in another interval it talks about this at the end of the endure book when it talks about the fact that this might be all backed by science but he talks about one of the athletes who said or a coach that said one of the best interval workouts you could ever do was five by time five by a mile and then you finish and you collapse and your coach says you need to do one more and that's the critical bit is you don't think you can, but you do it because you have to. You're told you have to and you know that you, sh- you, you should and you kind of want to. And when you do that, when you've given your all, but then you do another one, it has an incredibly powerful effect. OK, so how do you get this across into your own training? Well, you can start doing things like, as I say, reducing the rest, setting parameters on the rest. So, for instance, let's say they, there was a great study that showed a, a great benefit for interval training when they took the rest the arbitrary rest away and replaced it with dropping to a certain heart rate. And that was about 65, 70%. So if you take, if you do that, so if you do, let's say you're doing, that you can start off possibly with the four minute intervals, but say you have to restart the four minutes when your heart rate drops to 70% of max, you'll find that you may only have a minute break. Your heart rate will drop really quickly. As you get more fatigued, it might take a little longer, but actually you'll be surprised how little rest you get. And then just look away, look away from the power. Don't think about that. Think about the fact that you're trying to accumulate overload. You're not trying to accumulate the perfect amount of a maximum amount of power. Because the problem with shorter stuff as well, anything less than about six minutes is there's a big anaerobic component. So this first couple of minutes feels relatively easy because you've got all muscle systems firing, everything firing on full cylinders. So that high power feels relatively effortless and then things start falling off a bit of a cliff. And that's suddenly when you lose that that element and you then have to start using really the only kind of essentially aerobic system or you're starting to recruit lots of other muscle fibers and you're going kind of anaerobic and you're accumulating lots of lactate. And that's the critical thing. That's why eight minutes and those intervals are so powerful. Go longer than that and you may hold back too much. So it's all about finding that balance where essentially the way to do it is you want to get into a situation where maybe three quarters of the way through the interval, you're not sure if you can finish it. So six minutes in, you're thinking, I'm, I'm not sure I can make it to eight minutes, but I'm going to try my best. And then start playing with this idea of, of maybe not having set interval patterns or lengths of time. You know, I did one the other day when I was watching the end of a tour stage, which I knew had a big climb. 
and it was about 800 metres to go. And I said I was just going to hold as high as power I could till the finish. I had no idea how long it was going to take them. The lead rider then blew up, which meant that everything slowed down. And that ticker of kind of 800 metres, 700 metres was going so slowly. And I thought I could be there all day. In the end, it turned out to be about five and a half, six minutes, which was I had been doing the inter- I'd been doing four minute intervals with a relatively short break with only a minute break. So actually going then for six minutes at the end with all out was was really tough. But it's those kind of things that it's all about playing with that psychology. And that actually you're trying to push yourself just a little harder than you really want to. So that's the way I believe that you should approach that interval training is that you go, you elongate things just ever so slightly. And then each, maybe each week, you try and do a little more. Another thing that Stephen Saylor mentioned is that, this is, goes back to the little bit of stuff about the sweet spot, is that don't always think about increasing the power during a certain block. So let's say you decide that for a certain four weeks, you're going to do it at 95% of your 2 max. Now, it doesn't matter whether you know what that is or what that means, but it, let's say you hit a certain power in those intervals. Well, next week, try and hit those same power in those intervals, but try and go a little, like, little further, a little longer and approach it from that perspective rather than always trying to increase that power. Get Take that power. Because what that then does is it shows you if you are improving. If the week before, let's say you did four by eight minute intervals, which is a classic session from that group and kind of with a very short kind of two minute or three minute rest. And then the next week, you're, do the, you're doing exactly the same four by eight minute intervals and you're at that power and you feel like you get to the end, towards the end, of that last interval and you you can go a little longer or maybe you blew up a little bit on the the previous one but this time you don't because you're looking down and you're saying well I know how I did that power before I can do it again and pushing things up just a little bit but being able to hold for slightly longer demonstrates and you know if you if you then let's say you start the first interval of that four by eight and you're doing 20 watts higher you don't know then again you're in that that limbo zone your brain doesn't know whether it can hold that so actually, you may end up not being able to hold it. And that would be, you then think, well, I've, I've failed this. And it's like, well, have you or haven't you? You don't know. Because you may not hold it for the duration, but you may have been holding a slightly higher power. So if you hold the same power for, the, for essentially that duration and then can go a little further, you have a definitive answer as to whether you and your brain have worked together to improve your, essentially, that, that endurance. And that's obviously physiological basis. There's There's that the psychological ways and all those things, at the end of the day, they all end up in performance. It doesn't really matter whether it's pure physiology that's improved that or whether it's psychology. If your performance is improving and you're happy about that, that is the most important thing. So that's my take on the interval training side of things. The other thing I just want to add in is that sometimes it's worth going through week or two week blocks where you block a lot of these interval sessions really close together to induce overload as long as you recover on the other side, that's great. Sometimes every successful kind of VO2 max boosting program I've ever seen has done a ridiculous amount of VO2 max and heavy work within the space of a few days, if not a couple of weeks. Recent, the recent sleep flow studies that used long, hard five minute intervals at that kind of VO2 max and heavy effort were doing them on every other day. So doing this thing once a week may not be enough to actually really induce that overload. So, so consider blocking things together with periods of rest afterwards to see whether that improves things. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any more questions, let me know. Thank you much. Bye-bye.